All right, as promised, and to replace the uh, canceled lecture, this is going to be um, a lecture on meiosis and Mendelian genetics. So we're moving into talking about genetics. And before we do that, we have to talk about the second type of cell division, which is meiosis. So if you recall, in our lecture in class, we talked about mitosis which was cell division that happens in all body cells that divide. So meiosis is different and meiosis only happens in sex cells. So in humans, our sex cells, are our, our, our sex organs uh, are where we have our sex cells, which is where the this process occurs. And the overarching goal, so like the big picture of meiosis is to produce gametes, which are sperm and egg, or sperm and eggs, pardon me. Um, so we're going to start with that, and then we're going to talk a little bit about Mendelian genetics. So here is kind of a very, you know, big picture overview of meiosis. And we did, you guys did this in lab already, and so you have some understanding of this. So I'm not going to go into all the details, but I want to refresh your memory on the big differences between meiosis and mitosis. So mitosis was just where we started with a parent cell and we replicated it. So we ended with two cells. We started with a diploid cell, which is the parent cell, and we ended with two diploid daughter cells. And essentially all we did in mitosis is prior to the cell division portion, which happens in um, interphase, during interphase, in the S is in SAM phase. In the S phase, that's when all the DNA replicates. And then and then that gets us ready to divide. And then we go out of the S phase and into the G2 phase, and then right into the um, phases of mitosis. And mitosis gets subdivided into prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and cytokinesis. And during that process, basically what happens is in prophase, all the chromosomes get, all the genetic material winds up really densely into chromosomes, and the nuclear envelope degrades. And then essentially all those chromosomes line up single file on the metaphase plate, and then they get pulled apart at the centromere, the thing that holds them together, holds those duplicated, um, you know, each sister is a duplicate, so that separates those duplicates, and then um, they pull apart during anaphase, and then the nuclear envelope reforms around them in telophase in the two on the two poles of the cell, and then the cell gets pinched down the middle, and then we have two cells. That's met that's mitosis in a nutshell. Um, of course, there's details, and you'll want to review them, but that's the the summary of it. If you don't remember any of that, this would be a good time to stop and go back and look at your notes from, from mitosis. So meiosis is also cell division, but if, with meiosis, we're going to end up with, start with one parent cell, which is diploid, as you can see right here, right? Here's our parent cell. The chromosomes are replicated, just like we see in mitosis. And then we're going to go through two division cycles. And we call these this this we call meiosis reduction division. So in the first division cycle, we're going to reduce the total number of chromosomes, but they're still joined together at the centromere. Um, and then we are going to um, next in our second division cycle, we're going to pull those chromosomes apart, right? We're going to pull those sisters apart, and then we're going to end up with four cells. So again, we start with a diploid cell, right? Diploid is the name for a cell that has a complete set, a replicated, a complete set of chromosomes. Um, and then we go, we, and so look here in this one, you see we have four chromosomes over here. So what we're gonna do in the first phase of meiosis is we're gonna half the number of chromosomes. So in each of these cells, you see you have two, but notice they're still joined. Because there's half the number of chromosomes, we're gonna call them haploid. And then, we're going to go through this all one more time and we're going to pull these apart. So you notice that the four, the products of meiosis, the final products of meiosis, we have these individual sisters, so they're not duplicated anymore. And there's two number, two chromosomes. So we started with four duplicated chromosomes. At the end of meiosis one, we have two still duplicated chromosomes, so half the number of chromosomes, and then we pull them apart. So there's still two, but they're half. And these are also referred to as haploid. So it's two phases of division, and we call them reduction division. First, we reduce the number of chromosomes, and then we pull them the sisters apart. So in a nutshell, that's meiosis. Of course, we go through with meiosis, like you did in lab. You know that there's 
in meiosis one, there's prophase one, metaphase one, anaphase one, telophase one. And in the second portion, we have prophase two, anaphase two, or te metaphase two, anaphase two, telophase two of meiosis two. Um, so you, one of the things you want to make sure you know is, and if you were to be asked on a test, you want to be to, with my, in, re, in regards to meiosis, you want to be sure that you specify if this is happening in prophase one of meiosis one or prophase two of meiosis two. So that, that, that is a, that's kind of a sticky point. So make sure you know if you're in the first, the first division cycle and the second, and you identify it as such. Okay, so um, interphase, remember, is not part of the division cycle. Interphase is the part of the cell cycle where the cell's doing whatever it does, you know, it's doing its job, and then we that's G in the G1, then we go into S where we duplicate everything, all of that's the same, whether it's a sex cell or a body cell, then we go into G2 where we wrap it all up, make sure that you, you know, make sure everything replicated correctly, and make sure you have all the energy necessary to then divide. And then with meiosis, then we start with meiosis one. So in prophase one of meiosis one, it's gonna look a lot like, um, it's gonna look a lot like prophase of mitosis, except for there's some specific things. And I, I'm gonna point those specific things out to you on this slide. So in prophase one of meiosis one, the replicated chromosomes condense, that's just like prophase of mitosis, but the, homo the homologous pairs, the homologs, pardon me, the homologous chromosomes are gonna find one another. So I'm gonna flip back to the slide for a second for the visual. So these, these are homologs, right? These are gonna be your homologous pair, right? They represent this, they carry the same information. So one would be from your mother and one would be their father. This would be a pair. These guys, because they're the same size and shape, this is a pair. So what's going to happen in meiosis one, prophase one of meiosis one, they're going to find each other. So they're going to go next to one another. And then in metaphase one, those paired homologs are going to line up down the center of the cell. So they're going to line up, instead of single file down the center of the cell in mitosis, they're going to line up with their pair. You know, so the pairs are going to line up at the metaphase pl plate, which makes sense because remember what we're doing here is we're halving the number of chromosomes. We're not pulling them apart. We're taking half of them. So that happens. So first, the, the th thing that has to happen in prophase one is the homologs have to find one another, right? So they pair up. When they pair up, they oftentimes the arms can overlap. And I'll show you a picture of this in a second. The arms of the, the individual chromatids from each pair, when they lined up, stand next to one another, the arms can overlap and they can swap genetic information. And that's called crossing over. And again, I'll show you a picture of this. You saw this picture in the lab on your presentation as well. And then the other thing that's going to happen, which is similar to mitosis, is the spindle is going to form. So for the most part, it sounds, and, and, and I should say, the nuclear envelope is going to degrade. All of that is the same. So the big difference between meiosis one and uh, prophase one of meiosis one and prophase of, of mitosis is the pairing of the homologs and the crossing over. All right, and that's significant, that crossing over, but I'm going to come circle back around to that in a little bit. In metaphase one, I, like I said earlier, the paired homologs are going to line up down the center of the cell. So instead of lining up single file, they're going to line up with their pair. And then those pairs are going to separate, but they're going to stay joined at the centromere. So one, one um, chromosome is going to go, one chromosome from the mother is going to go one direction. One chromosome from the father is going to go the other direction. That's going to happen in anaphase. And then in telophase, we're going to, you know, split those cells essentially in half, nuclear you know, we're going to split it in half. And then we're going to do this all over again in with meiosis two, which is ex essentially is sen the exact same thing. The chromosomes are going to condense again. They're going to line up down the middle, but this time they're going to line up single file because there are not, the pairs have already separated. And then in anaphase, they're going to, the sister chromatids are going to split. So this is going to look a lot like um, this is going to look a lot like mitosis, exactly like mitosis, except for at the end, you're going to have half the number of chromosomes that you would in a normal body cell. 
And again, because that's, that's because we're making gametes. A gamete is a sperm and an egg. The whole purpose for this is for those, for those sperm to be able to um, fertilize the egg when they come in contact with one another, ideally. And when that happens, they're going to pool their genetic information. So they, they want to produce a cell that has a complete set of chromosomes. So they have to only have half the number of chromosomes because if they had twice, if they had a full set, they both had a full set and they pooled, they'd have, we'd have twice as many chromosomes as we need, which would not be compatible with life. So that's the whole deal. So again, when you learning about cell division, it's at least for me, I think it's really important to think about where are we actually going with this? Like what's actually happening here? So at the end of meiosis two, you're gonna have four haploid cells and those are called gametes. And in a human, those are called sperm and egg cells. So I wanna circle back around and talk about crossing over and then I wanna talk about um, a couple other things that are gonna increase variability. So one of the big advantages of meiosis is that it, you know, it's like kind of like a big gene scramble, right? We, we What we're trying to gain here is as much variability as possible. And of course, this is evident if you ever look at, if you can, you know, find a big family and you look at everybody in the family, like they're not all identical, obviously. There's a lot of variation and a lot of that has to do with what's going on in meiosis. So one of the things that really ups the ante in terms of increasing variability is crossing over. So you can see in our picture down here, right? So these these are our sisters. These This is our homologous pair. And each of these has carrying the same genetic information, maybe different forms of the allele, but it codes for the same information. And we'll get into you know, this in a little bit more when we talk about genetics, but just for the purposes of discussion. So you see these letters A, B, C, D, E, F. This codes for, for these, these chromosomes code for genes that represent, that, that, that allow for the expression of certain traits, right? So it could be like eye color, your hair, if it's straight or curly, or, you know, your skin tone, like all sorts of things. So this sister codes for the same information, right? You notice that the letter, you know, these are uppercase letters and these are lowercase letters. And that means that this is a dominant gene and this is a recessive gene, but that's, but it's a carry, it's the same information it's not like this is this is eyes and this is hair right that wouldn't work at all it has to be the same information so when they line up next to one another you notice how the arms overlap when the arms overlap there's like imagine like little genetic scissors that can snip off this little bit of the blue and snip off this little bit of the pink and swap it so we've just exchanged information now, when these things ultimately are gonna split, right? So this is the pair. So in meiosis one, these guys are gonna line up in prophase next to one another. And that's when this crossing over occurs. Then what's gonna happen is um, after metaphase and anaphase, this, this, this chromosome is going to go this direction. This chromosome is going to go that direction. So that little bit of that little pink on that was on the blue is going to go with this. And at the end of meiosis two, these are going to split. So this one sister is going to end up in a cell by itself. And, and now it carries a little bit of information from the, let's say this is the mother's and this is the father's on that one. So that's a gene scramble essentially, right? That's upping the ante, that, that increases genetic variability. It makes, it, it just increases the, the expression of these traits. The, the, it, it increases the variability in the expression of every trait you can possibly inherit. So that's super cool and, and it's kind of weird, but it's, it's really cool. So, um, um, they call the site where the chromosomes crossing over the chi the chiasma. You can see there, which you don't need to remember. But um, and then you can see them being held together by the centromere there. Okay, so that's crossing over. So what you're going to want to remember about that is when does it happen? Specifically, it happens in prophase one of meiosis one. You need the one, and you need to tell meiosis right. If you just said prophase. It doesn't make sense. Or if you just said prophase of meiosis, we don't know if it's one or two. So it's prophase one of meiosis one. And the point of it is that it increases the genetic variability. It results in new gene combinations, which makes us, you know, makes, you know, gives us, it's just, it just makes it everything more exciting. <laughs> it makes everything, it makes each of us more and more unique. Okay, another thing that happens that increases variability is when the homologous pairs 
when the homologs pair and then they migrate to the metaphase plate, they line up independently, meaning that all the pink ones, like if they were really pink and blue, all the pink ones don't line up on one side of the metaphase plate and all the blue ones don't line up on the other. All the chromosomes from your mother don't line up on the left side, let's say, and all the chromosomes from your father are on the right. The the number one will line up with number one, but the pink one might be on the left side and then the blue one might be on the right. And then when numbers two line up, the blue one might be on the left and the pink one might be on the right. So there's all sorts of, we have 23 pairs. So basically you have two to the 23rd power of possi different possibilities in how these chromosomes line up on the metaphase plate. So this happens in metaphase one of meiosis one, and we call it independent assortment. It's not like chromosome one is gonna line up, is gonna stand, it's gonna, gonna align with chromosome five. That one and one and two and two and three and three, they still stay together, but it just, um, in terms of which side of the metaphase plate they, they line up on, that's what we talk about when we talk about independent assortment. And again, that's going to increase variability. So you add that with the fact that, that they can, when they cross over, that's going to really increase variability even more. And then the third is what we call random fertilization. So remember, we have one in the one to the twenty-third power possibilities of different sperm egg sperm configurations, and one to the twenty-third power possible egg configurations, which gives us somewhere in the neighborhood of seven seventy trillion unique combinations, right? So that is a lot of variability, right? That is why you are not exactly the same as your brother and your sister and your cousin and all of that, right? We're very, very different, right? Even though we come from the same, you know, you come from, if you have, let's say you have a family of 10 kids, right? Those 10 kids can, you know, all act different, look different, almost be like they're, in some cases, in some families, from different parents entirely and um but they're not it's just that there's all this all these possibilities between crossing over independent assortment and random fertilization there's no way to say which which sperm is gonna you know fertilize which egg not to mention that the sperm and the eggs are, are not from the same parents so you know now we're like really really increasing um or, or I, I, sh I should say the, the sperm and the egg are n not, you know, both from, from the exact same person, right? So obviously, so we are hopefully when we reproduce, we're not reproducing with a close relative. Um, and the reason why that is, is not such a good idea is because it narrows the gene pool, right? Rather than, rather than expanding the gene pool, it narrows the gene pool. You know, I think it's, that's, we talked about this in, in my lecture that I gave live, but that, you know, I think it's in most cases, unless it's happening all the time, um, like we see in some, if we look back in history, in some families that chose to just interbreed, um, that didn't work out so well for them because they kept shrinking and shrinking and shrinking their gene pool. And when you do that, your, your chances of um, genetic abnormalities increase just because the, the, the gene pool is getting smaller and smaller versus if it, if you were to just, if one of us just married our brother or our sister, that is the thought that I don't want to have with my respect to my own brother. But if we did that, um, it probably wouldn't be that big of a deal just once, you know, provided we don't have genetic diseases, but that's more of a social issue. I think cultural taboo than it is, a then it is then it is an actual biologic problem if it was just to happen once but if you were if it was a practice and it was happening repetitively then the gene pool gets smaller and smaller and more and more shallow okay that's a conversation for more of a sociology class though not so much for a biology class okay so we have three things that increase variability one is crossing over and that happens in prophase one of meiosis one one is independent assortment, which happens in metaphase one of meiosis one. And third here is random fertilization. Okay, so what you're gonna wanna do at this point is you want to make sure you're solid on the differences between mitosis and meiosis. So on your study guide that I gave you, there's a chart. And on that chart, there's a place for mitosis and meiosis. And then it asks, what kinds of cells undergo mitosis and what kind of cells undergo meiosis? So as we have been discussing, in mitosis, 
all the all cells that divide with the exception of sex cells undergo mitosis. So we call those somatic, S-O-M-A-T-I-C, somatic cells. Sex cells undergo meiosis, period. That's it. The number of cell divisions in mitosis, we just divide, we go through one cell division. In meiosis, we do it twice. We call that reduction division. In the first division, set in the first phase of division phase, we reduce the number of chromosomes. In the second, we pull those sisters apart. The number of daughter cells produced in mitosis is two, and they're exactly the same as their parents. So the cell you start with is diploid. The cells you end with in mitosis are diploid. In meiosis, we start with one diploid cell. Same, starts off the same, but we end with four haploid cells at the end of meiosis two. At the end of meiosis one, we have two haploid cells. They have half the chromosome number. So with mitosis, the chromosome number of the parents and the daughters are the same. And going down one more, the similarity of the daughters are identical. With meiosis, the chromosome number is half. You have half the number of chromosomes at the end of meiosis two. At the end of meiosis one, well, I should say at the end of meiosis two, one, you have half the number of chromosomes. And then at the end of meiosis two, you still have half the number of chromosomes, but they're unduplicated. And they're not at all similar, the daughter cells. They're not similar at all. There's a lot more variation. Um, and then the last two are, are like a yes or no. Does this happen? Do homologs pair in mitosis? Hopefully you're saying in your head, nope, there are no homologs pairing in mitosis, but they do pair in meiosis. They do that in the beginning in prophase one. And crossing over, does that happen in mitosis? Nope, there's no homo homologous pairing, and so there's no crossing over. So that only happens in meiosis. So here's a little visual of the two, right? It leaves out a lot of details, but it tells you some of the important stuff. Um, so again, you're going to want to know the significant things that happen, and we're going to start our class on um, our next class. We're going to start with a, a review activity where you're going to go through this with a group, and you're going to try to make sure you have a pretty good handle on this, this cell division, both mitosis and meiosis, to prepare you for your test. So meiosis 2, you can see down here, meiosis 2 is, is basically the exact same as mitosis except for the end, you're having four cells, you're ending up with four cells with half the number of chromosomes versus with mitosis, you, you end up with two cells that are diploid. Okay, so you're gonna review that. All right, so I'm gonna stop, well, I'll, I'll talk about this slide and then I'm going to stop this video and go on to one more, go on to the next one. So we're moving now into genetics. And so before we do that, there's a couple things that you need to be pretty comfortable with. The first is you need to know where the DNA is. And by this point in our class, if you don't know where the DNA is, something is has gone really, really wrong. So, so we are going to find our DNA in our nucleus, right? That's where it is, and it's found on our chromosomes. So hopefully you're comfortable with that. A gene was introduced to you in your lab. A gene is essentially a portion of the DNA that encodes for the production of a specific protein or a nucleic acid, specifically RNA. So that's what a gene is. Each gene can have different forms, and those different forms we call alleles. So each gene can have many alleles or alternate forms. And these alleles are the things that we're going to inherit. And this is going into our conversation um, on genetics. We'll talk about alleles in more detail. So each of us inherits two alleles from, for each trait from our parents. We in inherit, pardon me, one allele from our mother and one from our father. And that's because our cells are diploid and we get half of our genetic information from our mom and half of our genetic information from our dad. That's what we were just talking about. That's what happens when the egg and sperm pool all their in genetic information. The result is a diploid organism. So all of our cells are diploid. 
and half of that genetic information came from our mother and half of it came from our father. The alternate forms of each of our genes are called alleles. So that's what we're moving into next. So I'm going to stop here and pick it up with a introduction into Mendelian genetics.